All right, you ready? Uh, yep. Everything's good. Whoops. Whoopsie. All right. <laughs> audience <laughs> hello well we could call our audience idiots hey, hello idiots yes we're talking to you now <laughs> that's the name of this podcast <laughs> two idiots talk because we're talking to all of you and also we are two idiots and my name is nate and i'm will and today we're going to be talking to you about a li- something a little bit different than we've been talking about these past few episodes yeah different avenue different uh different vibe you might say definitely more recent i think besides yeah yeah we have been talking more about like older things well not technically no no we're it's the same time frame as bob lazar so oh yeah okay early 70s yeah okay yeah 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 between the late 20th century so if you haven't guessed by the title of this episode uh which is now on all podcasting platforms and youtube hope hope yes can I get a little Wait, shout what? for... I don't know. I, I tried to say hooray and whoop at the same time. her <laughs> Whoops. Um, but Whoopsie yeah. doopsie. You could be listening to this on Spotify or Apple Music or However Google you like. Podcasts or... Yeah. We're doing this for the ease of you. We want you to feel good. Also, we want the most amount of people to possibly listen to us because we're... Exactly. We're greedy. Yeah, we're greedy. Um... But anyway, if you haven't guessed what we're talking about already, uh, we're going to be talking about the Stanford Prison Experiment, um, which is a psychological experiment that happened in the early 70s in Palo Alto, California. Palo Alto. At Stanford University, obviously. Dumb idiots. Come on. Wait. Wait. Hold on. Wait. Did the Stanford Prison Experiment happen in Palo Alto? I thought so. Isn't that where Stanford is? I thought that was where the third wave happened. Is that pretty sure if both of these happened in the if you can't guess now we're going to talk about the third wave too like are they both in palo alto yeah that's why i wanted to talk about them both in the same episode because it's fun holy (laughs) shit my mind is blown no sarah mall uh 450 sarah mall stanford california oh whoops (laughs) yeah get it right (laughs) i mean it might be close i I don't know oh they're like they're like (laughs) 20 minutes away from each other dude okay all right. <laughs> Separated this by location, a location, California's now. got some weird shit. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, something was in the water. So uh, we'll give you a quick rundown of the Stanford ex- experiment if you haven't heard about it. But uh, this guy, I don't know his first name, Doctor Zimbardo. Zimbardo, Philip Zimbardo. Do we want to talk about? Do we want to give the rundown, or do we want to talk about what we initially thought? Yeah. Screw the rundown. We don't need that shit. Let's Screw just talk rundown. about our initial the rundown. The rundown. The rundown will be when we explain what actually happened. Yeah. All right. Do you want to go first? Yeah. Go for it. All right. So, I heard about this just like Nate, probably high school. You know, when I was younger, didn't really give a shit about it. Just something that happened was like, oh, that's weird. I'm sure you have to, and I'm sure this is exactly what you heard, or maybe you know more. Maybe you know more than we did, but. What I thought it was was some guy took a couple of people and threw them into a makeshift prison to see what would happen. And I was always told that these people spontaneously took the roles of prisoners and guards without any coaching. And this led very quickly to the guards abusing the prisoners. And it was a it was something to help explain the nature of man and uh, how bad we are. We're bad boys. Um, and I never really... What you gonna do when we go for <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> that was playing the whole time during the experiment, and it drove them insane, and that's what caused <laughs> them to, to fuck with each other. So, yeah, no, I just took it, I just took it face value because I didn't really... You know, I was in high school. I just wanted to play video games. I didn't really care. <laughs> um, so I didn't think about it, and... It wasn't like I, I first started hearing it might not be exactly what we thought um, in college a couple years ago. So, and then still didn't look into it and never really dived as deep as we did until now. Um, 
So again, just like other things, it's slightly different than what we thought it was. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, that's Nate. like that's our main theme, I think, is just taking uh original first glance, first impressions of topics that we find interesting and then doing a little bit of a deeper investigation into why they might not be as truthful as we once thought. And, and uh, hey, we might find something later down the road that is as truthful as we thought, and we'll be ecstatic. We're not trying to do this. We're not debunkers. Right. We're not trying to be that. Yes, thank you for clarifying. That is a good point. Sometimes in the future, we would hope that one of the topics we discuss will be uh, reinforced. Yes. Positively. <laughs> um, but yeah, just like Will, I heard about this um, for the first time in high school. Uh, I took psychology as an elective. And I had already had my uh, psychology teacher for history class the year before, so I trusted him. We had a rapport. He liked me as a student. Um, so I didn't really question, you know, any of the methods or outcomes. I was just like, okay, this is cool, and it, it would explain a lot about human nature and why people become, I guess, quote-unquote evil due to power structures in general. With that, I guess we can... Now we can get into the rundown. Now we can get into the rundown of what crazy crackpot Zimbardo was. <laughs> All right, I went first last time, so I'll let you take the, take okay. the initial on this one. Okay, so basically, uh, what was it, 1971, April, this uh, psychology professor at... Stanford University named Philip Zimbardo wanted to conduct a, a two-week-long experiment where he put um, 24 males in a prison scenario. Uh, and he put an ad out in the paper and he asked for uh, people to join his prison experiment. He s explicitly called it that. So, you know, that might attract yes. some uh, skewed attention already, right? Right. right from the beginning. So we had these 12 uh, guards and 12 prisoners who already knew that they were going to be in a prison scenario. Um, the guards were given uh, anonymity in a sense with mirrored sunglasses, all the same uniform, and uh, they were also given um, the batons. And mm -hmm. then and uh, prison uniforms, khaki pants and shirts. Also, real quick, um, I want to explain real quick that also this was set up in the basement of Stanford. They built a mock prison and had 12 guards and 12 prisoners um, as well. I just wanted to include that real quick. Yeah. Um, every prisoner was given their own cell. They had to wear – they were all strip searched um, and – arrested in the streets of their neighborhoods by real cops right yeah um, mock arrests yeah and uh yeah. they did a whole processing thing do the thumbprints and threw them in the car yeah. and everything um and then once they were taken to the prison they were strip searched um and given smocks to wear no undergarments and a chain around one of their ankles to rem remind them that they were prisoners <laughs> and stripped of their names and given numbers instead <laughs> yeah which actually um it was I'm I'm fairly certain the guards idea to depersonalize them that way. Oh. Like yeah, I I remember reading that the it was the guards idea to refer to them as their numbers and to make them recite their So that's another thing. Mm -hmm. Um we might be jumping around a little bit, but they forced their the prisoners to recite their numbers. Right. To not use their names. This was a tactic of depersonalization which Zimbardo asked for. Right. He coached the guards and said it is okay we want them to be incredibly bored we want to instill a sense of hopelessness we want to disorient them depersonalize them take away their individuality because initially so, initially it didn't seem like it was going this way because a lot of the prisoners right. weren't taking it seriously they were pushing back against orders they were mocking the guards and laughing at their orders um they had more of a sense of solidarity uh and like group uh, behavior where they were taking it lightly and they knew it was an experiment which again I don't know why I didn't question that in high school like how can you have a, a trustworthy experiment if all of the people involved know exactly what's supposed to be yep. what's going well, on that's why 
That's why some of the critiques are that this isn't an experiment. Yeah, they're... like he didn't have control groups. He didn't actually do anything. He just grabbed a bunch of people and were like, "Do something." Right. There, there were no blinds for the experiment or or control. So I, I think after the first day, after the pendulum was swinging back and forth of you know the control going from the guards to the prisoners, um, and back and forth and back and forth. The second day, uh, Zimbardo said that it was okay, you know, for the guards to be a little more creative i guess aggressive yeah Ooh. also should specify in this uh scenario zimbardo was acting as the superintendent oh you're right that like is he important. was he was participating in the experiment which is another reason why it's not very scientific because you know he was the one running it and he was actively within the experiment and his undergrad research assistant was acting as the warden and then as nate said on the second day they came in and the warden the research assistant and there's, uh, I believe, audio recording of this is telling one of the guards, you need to be more aggressive. Like, you're not participating correctly. <laughs> you need to be more aggressive. And one of the guys, uh, I think you have his real name, but a lot of references just refer to him as the John Wayne Warden guard. Dave Eshelman. Yes. Uh, he kind of took this role in stride. Like, it seemed he... I remember him saying uh, in one of the documentaries that I watched that he made his own little experiments along the way to see how much he, he could yeah, get away yeah. with. So this might he, have... Yeah, he... Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, this might have had something to do with the pendulum not swinging back into the prisoner's control because he... Yes. He was acting as if he was a god, essentially. And he knew what he was doing, and he, he wanted Zimbardo right. to get the results that... He knew that he wanted because Zimbardo told him what results he wanted, which, yeah. Exactly. So I, I have a quote from Dave Eshelman, which I can read uh, for the audience. Um, Dave Eshelman was a theater student and came into this, according to him, doesn't, doesn't have a bad bone in his body, <laughs> and <laughs> came, came into this and oh, yikes. actively wanted to you know, help the experiment. He knew what they were going for, just like you can determine from the ad they put out that it was a prison experiment. He knew what they wanted, so he was doing a certain thing. So the quote from him after all of this was, what came over me was not an accident. It was planned. I set out with a definite plan in mind to try to force the action, force something to happen so that the researchers would have something to work with. After all, what could they possibly learn from guys sitting around like it was a country club? So I consciously created this persona I was in all kinds of drama productions in high school and college. It was something I was very familiar with, to take on another personality before you step out of the stage, out on the stage. I was kind of running my own experiment there by saying, how far can I push these things, and how much abuse will these people take before they say, knock it off? But the other guards didn't stop me. They seemed to join in. They were taking my lead. Not a single guard said, I don't think we should do this. Yeah. And they started calling him John Wayne because he, he put on a southern accent. He started act. He was he was emulating a different actor, and I, I don't have it written down what actor he was emulating, but it was a Western actor, mm -hmm. like a Western movie actor. But they just started calling him John Wayne because, you know, it was kind of the persona. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that was one of the most interesting things, too, that I didn't read too much into. Like, you would think that a, a guard would stop, like another one of the members of guards, if things were getting out of hand. They would right. step in between. Well, to them, it's not. Like, you got to, like, they're in an experiment, so in their mind, especially with young people. It's not real. When you have somebody older, it's not real. And when you have somebody older telling you to do this, it's, you know, hey, if we do get out of hand, they'll stop us. They're gonna, they're not going to let this keep going if this gets crazy. Ha! But, <laughs> yeah. Ha! <laughs> uh, so, a little more of the details that I, I dug up about this experiment was that the um, first prisoner to have a mental breakdown because of mistreatment was released a day and a half after the experiment started so not even two whole days mm -hmm. and this was supposed to last two weeks initially that's a theme with these things that we researched um they happen a lot faster than you expect right it's unsettling it's a little bit yeah and they also got but you have to think like if if he, they're coaching so okay here's another little detail about the actual like environment they're in they were working normal shifts, so the prisoners were forced to stay there 24-7. Yeah, Like, they themselves. slept there, they ate there, everything. The guards did eight-hour shifts. They would come in, do eight-hour shifts, and then go home. This is a long amount of time. Yeah. So if they're getting coached into, like, hey, you need to be more aggressive, it kind of makes sense that things kind of escalated a little faster than we might expect. Yeah. Another thing about the coaching, this didn't just happen 
with the guards. There were also prison pastors that came in and legal oh, I didn't know that. legal consultants that tried to inform the prisoners of their rights. What? <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah. And yeah. I didn't know that. So the prisoners were even like had what? this mentality <laughs> of I'm doing everything wrong. Oh yeah. That actually that reminds me of another thing uh, that you probably just about to bring up, so I apologize I'm interrupting you. But um You're good, you're good. They also were beginning to argue for parole. Like yep. they were yeah. so they were getting paid f- paid for this. So um I can't remember the exact number, but in today's money it would be around a hundred dollars a day. Something like that. Yep. Sounds right. Uh, with in- with inflation. So they were getting paid. And they for if they left, they forfeited their pay, which is in its own thing kind of fucked up. I didn't know that. They by like halfway through they started arguing for parole. They literally were like, hey, I will forfeit all of my pay to leave on a literal parole where I can risk coming back. Like, they began, <laughs> yep. like, being prisoners, which just plays into... So, Zimbardo specifically wanted this. Zimbardo wanted to show that people fall into roles very easily, and this is how bad things happen. So, this kind of played into his hand let's try to get all the way through of like the the timeline um okay so uh i was i didn't know that and i i'm glad you brought it up but what i was going to say next is that they had visiting days um and the first one occurred three days into the experiment but Mm -hmm. in order to hide i don't know any lighter way to put it they literally just hid the conditions from the parents they cleaned up up everything um oh my god they rearranged the cells uh they only allowed they like established these arbitrary rules where the parents were only allowed to see their kids, um, their sons for 10 minutes at a time. Um, and I think one parent each, the guards were super Jesus. friendly. They were greeted by an attractive receptionist. Uh, there was like music <laughs> playing like friendly elevator music. So they really fucking put on a front here. And that really rubbed me the yeah. wrong way. Like out of all the initial stuff that I heard, I can't believe that was taken out because that was something that I think really would alter the mindsets of the sons feeling even more trapped to not, you know, be able to tell the truth to their parents. And their parents didn't believe them, obviously, because they trusted right. Zimbardo. Yeah, the authority figure. Yeah. And after the first visiting day, I don't know if you heard this, but uh, the guards had heard rumors of a an escape attempt led yes, by yes. the initial prisoner who was set free. And I don't know if that right. rumor was started by one of the guards or Zimbardo, but I doubt it was started mm. by one of the prisoners because yeah, right. <laughs> they were already in shit conditions. Um, yeah. So the escape was never attempted, but they had to like clean everything up and set a watch out for the returned prisoner to, that they thought was going to come break them out. And mm. after all this didn't happen, they w- had to take their aggression out on someone and they chose one prisoner to kind of single out and really break down mm-hmm. mentally. Um, and, and they had... All, Is this who they put in the cell? Yeah, they had them... And they put them in solitary confinement, and they had all the other prisoners, like, chant, this is this prisoner's fault, like, over and over. And uh, he was the second one to... Prisoner blah, 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 did something wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And he was the second one to um, leave. And then a new prisoner was introduced, which, ah, man, that's like... How can you do that? Yeah, why do people keep coming in? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. And like, how, how and can you keep the integrity of the test if you let someone in four days into the experiment? Like, you're right. And and I'm, I'm pretty sure this new guy, I, I could be mixing up if it's this new guy or not, just instantly came in and was like, hell no, this is ridiculous. And like, started getting them to do hunger strikes and shit. They were doing hunger strikes. But they alienated like, him. Right, specifically because he was trying to like cause revolt. Yeah, they, um, they didn't want any more punishments, so they didn't want anything to do with him. But yeah, uh, after this new prisoner was introduced, they were supposed to have another visiting day the day after. Mm-hmm. And uh, the guards weren't going to allow it. Like, they literally just gave guard, the guards free reign. They yeah, were give, they to were, do whatever they wanted. Yeah, yeah, they were making prisoners ask to go to the bathroom. They were shitting in buckets. In their cells, yeah. As a punishment. Yeah. They were f- for punishment for some of these g- prisoners. They were making them shit and piss in a in a bucket, and not weren't allowed to change the bucket. 
Yeah. And I see in some of your notes <laughs> like... um, some of the yikesy things. And one of the things that I don't think you have written was the homophobia that was induced into the prisoners. Uh, they The guards made them oh, do like super right. sexualized things. Act out sex, sexual acts. Yeah. Yes. One of one of the things that I saw in a documentary I watched was uh, marrying like the bride of Frankenst- Frankenstein, and they made them like get really close in their yeah. fucking one like thin ass smocks, and like practically kiss. Yeah, and uh, another yikes thing with the smocks is I feel like we have a yikes segment in all of these. <laughs> <laughs> another likes a yikes thing with the smocks is uh, a quote from Zimbardo. Our goal was to produce similar effects quickly by putting men in a dress without any underclothes. Indeed, as soon as some of our prisoners were put in these uniforms, they began to walk and sit differently and to hold themselves differently, more like a woman than like a man. Oof. Yikes. Oof. So Zimbardo had a girlfriend at the time, and he had been telling her about this experiment, and she finally wanted to come in and see it. Mm, right, right, right. So okay, yeah. she came in, and she was like, oh, my fucking God, you're insane. Like, this is... <laughs> yeah. borderline not even borderline this is literally abuse you're abusing these like kids. didn't he ignore her too originally didn't he go ah fuck off and then she like yeah. forced his hand yeah it was like a drawn out <laughs> conversation yeah she's like no you get he was drunk with power you're... yeah that's ah, fuck i forgot to mention that but that is one of like the through lines from this experiment to what we'll talk about later in the third wave is that yes. the the initiator and like the head of the experiment with great power comes with great responsibility and they <laughs> lacked a lot of responsibility basically they oh, yeah. they were power hungry and it got out of hand and the last thing i wanted to talk about before i kind of make some comparisons to the vsauce experiment mm, okay. is that there are two quotes that i pulled from the documentary and i want to see if you can guess <laughs> it's not that hard who <laughs> if a guard or a prisoner said them so here's the first quote. Okay. I don't see how anyone could go through prison without coming out extremely hateful. I'm, oh, I, I remember reading that, cause, but <laughs> I, I can't remember who it was by. That was a guard, wasn't it? No, that was a prisoner. That was a prisoner? Okay. Yeah. The the other one I, I already said I messed up, um, but he said, I was running little experiments of my own. So that was a guard. Mm-hmm. So I just thought those two quotes were interesting because I'm pretty sure they were talking to each other, like a prisoner and a guard were debriefing together. Oh, I, that's something I wanted to mention real quick mm-hmm. is the Dave Eshelman, the John Wayne guy. There's an, an interview. I'm pretty sure this is in the Vsauce video. We'll link that. The Vsauce did a video on this, and it's really good. Um, there was a, a recording of an interview between John Wayne, Dave Eshelman, and one of the prisoners. I don't remember how long after. It might. I don't remember if it's this debriefing or not. This might be what you're talking mm-hmm. about, where... They're talking, and the prisoner's, like, talking to this guy, like, what's wrong with you? Why were you yeah, doing those yeah. things? That was awful. <laughs> and Dave Eshelman, it's, this is why I find it hilarious that Dave Eshelman was like, I don't, I'm not a bad person. <laughs> no, this guy definitely seems like a bad person. Yeah. He is, not to, not to uh, smear his name or anything. Well, even in interviews he, now. This man was, yeah. yeah, like, he just comes off so weird. But in this interview, the debriefing, afterwards he's sitting back in his chair and like with his legs crossed he's like all smug looking and he's he's just like kind of like (laughs) yeah just kind of like laughing at the guy like saying that he was treated like shit and he's just like (laughs) i was running little experiments of my own i just wanted to see how far i could take it and the other guy's like what's wrong with you (laughs) literally Yeah, so as we said, uh, Vsauce, which is a popular YouTube channel, uh, you probably have heard of it if you're listening to this podcast. It has a lot of, you know, similar themes. But uh, they kind of tried to recreate this experiment. They tried to do it right by taking away uh, initial biases. They introduced anonymity in the correct way by literally just blacking out a room um, and instilling um a team sense i guess between the participants like the prisoners and guards were supposed to have a team sense and uh they found complete opposite results of the stanford prison experiment and right. when michael from vsauce interviewed zimbardo he asked him yeah. why do you think we got different results was, and zimbardo said i was gonna bring this up too <laughs> are you ready for this he said you picked the wrong people <laughs> <laughs> You picked you, the people you picked were too good. 
Uh, well, granted, we won't get too into depth in explaining what Vsauce did. Yeah, you should watch that uh, you video. You can watch that video. But he, they specifically looked for people with good personality traits. That is true. They gave them a personality quiz, and they picked the people who scored good on empathy. Yeah. But it's still funny that they did two experiments, one where they instilled this sense of you're competing with another group that you can't see, and you're able to do things to distract them that could potentially hurt them if you'd like. They didn't. The other team didn't exist, so they weren't actually hurting anybody. And without coaching them into it, nothing happened. Then they had another group where they were like, your entire job is to distract the other person. And they still didn't do it. Yep. And they never... And so when, yeah, they never took when the Michael talked to Zimbardo... To, yeah, they never took the opportunity yeah, they just to chatted. potentially hurt the other yeah. team. And like Nate said, when, <laughs> when it just was hilarious, Michael's just talking to Zimbardo, and Zimbardo's just like... Just the look on his face is just like, how dare you? <laughs> My life. <laughs> and he's just work. like, well, um... <laughs> Yeah, like everything I stand for. And he's just like looking at Michael just like, well, you clearly just picked really good people. <laughs> Otherwise, they would have been evil. Uh, <laughs> and he made this argument before, as I will delicately and gracefully segue into now, when he made an appearance <laughs> for a uh, – what, what do I want to say? <laughs> uh, Wait, what are a you legal about? case, sorry. The words escape ah, me yes, yes, yes. for Ivan Frederick, <laughs> who is a war criminal. Yes, Ivan Frederick. Uh, a bad boy, you might say. Um, you mind if I take this? Oh, yeah. I didn't do any research on this. So go for okay. it. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So a little background. There is a prison in Iraq called Abu Ghraib, Ghraib or however you pronounce it, uh, where it's a, mil it's a military prison for detainees that were thought to be a threat to the U.S. military and the United States itself, blah, blah, blah. You know how we were back then. Not the best. <laughs> Not even just back then. And mm, we're still pretty, like... Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, we're still pretty bad. But there was a particular... There was an issue happening where the cards were mistreating the prisoners, like, really bad. Really fucking badly. And most of these prisoners weren't, like, they, they weren't fucking terrorists that blew something up and then in prison. Like, these were just, like, detainees who were thought to be potential risks. Similar to the Stanford prison experiment, because those prisoners weren't guilty of anything. Exactly. <laughs> so what happened was, just like the prison experiment, the guards began abusing the prisoners. They were treating them badly. They were forcing them against each other. They were... Um, Stripping them naked, perform like faking performing um, homosexual acts because you know for some reason that why does that is, keep coming up? Universally thought, by, yeah, that's right. So why weird. did like dudes just like that's the worst thing you could do is be gay? God damn! <laughs> so toxic masculinity. They were forcing them to yeah, right. So they were forcing the prisoners to do shit and like uh, uh, fake fellatio on each other and shit. Oh my god! The people caught wind of this and some guards were charged with this you know it's inhumane and one of them was ivan frederick who was a, a private i believe no staff sergeant he was a staff sergeant which also staff sergeant he wasn't just following orders um, i don't know my ranking so <laughs> it's not that high but it's high it's, you're not a fucking private um but anyway ivan frederick was in court for doing all these things. And Zimbardo caught wind of this and was like, oh, this sounds a lot like my experiment. Oh, so shit. He I thought he was, like, intervene. asked to be there. He just showed up? Uh, uh, he might have been. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I genuinely can't remember. I apologize. Uh, either way, he shows up and is like, you know what? I'm going to side with Ivan Frederick. He's a good lad. He just was caught up in a lot of shit and thought that it was a systemic thing. So... Mm. Let me use this opportunity to say that Zimbardo hmm. had good intentions. Yeah. The point of what he was doing was to say systemic environments can cause people to do bad things, which is true. Absolutely true. But when you look at his experiment and then you look at him defending this man, you go, okay, but why are you trying to make this individual innocent? Yeah. Because of that. It's the same as the nature nurture like 
argument where people want to say it's one or the other when it's both. It's like people want to say it's systemic or individual. No, it's both. The right. military was saying it's bad apples, and then Zimbardo and Ivan Frederick were saying, no, it's uh, systemic. And Frederick co- or Zimbardo comes in and goes, no, I think this is a systemic thing. I'm going to defend him and use my experiment to defend him. And his defense team was saying things like, he's an introvert. He just wants to please people. He didn't stand against the human rights because it's a systemic problem, and he was just following orders. Yeah. Hmm. That that was how I uh, initially learned about this in psychology too. Was the whole nature versus nur- nurture argument, um, right? But I don't. I I watched another documentary, and I don't even think this was the first time that this argument was used in court. Because no. uh, I think oh, uh, Zimbardo has done this. I don't know if this is what you're talking about, but Zimbardo has defended a lot of bad people. I didn't look up everybody, mm-hmm. but he has done this many times. Yeah, I think for a military contracting group, there was a guy who he defended. Um, in court, who was pleading not guilty for robbing a bank, armed robbery. Um, he said he was just going along with his superior's orders. Oh, yeah, we're right. Yes, yes, yes. This was in the Vsauce video, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. That's where I saw it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So just real quick, in the Vsauce video, they bring up, they bring in this one guy who says, my brother was charged with a bank robbery, but he was the getaway driver, and Zimbardo came in to defend him, saying, ah, he was just following orders. And after everything, the dude's brother was like, yeah, no, I knew the whole time. I just yeah. wanted to do it. <laughs> right. <laughs> after he got off. And the, after, like, after he, he got off, not guilty. Exactly. Like, <laughs> so Zimbardo's just swooping in, being like, nah, these people are fine, dandy people. They're just d- corrupted by the system. It's like, cool, man. That's like, it's a good idea to have, but why are you defending bad people to right. get this the, point across you could be doing more things you could just be an activist rather than intervening in court cases and he's probably getting paid for it i don't know yeah i don't defending know defending bad people is <laughs> essentially the same thing as defending the bad system that you are supposedly fighting against in my eyes exactly so yes fix that the would system, be fix the people. that would be the same as modern times the argument versus bad cops or bad apples and then there's a bad systemic problem and then people going yeah this one cop who murdered a black guy it's just because the system's bad we shouldn't care about him. we shouldn't be mad at him for doing that it'd be the same thing which is ridiculous how are you going to make that argument and also be on the side of the system's bad like if okay if the system's bad and leading people to do these bad things do something to fix the system and don't apologize for these people doing bad things. You have to, yes. it's, the, the cognitive dissonance doesn't work. <laughs> nope, it doesn't. Yeah, I just, all right, yeah, let's let's do a quick wrap up before we move on. Okay, fun fact before we do, one of the prisoners from the experiment is now, or at least was um, back in like the late 90s, a prison psychologist, <laughs> mm. which I thought that w- was interesting. He was like, I don't want to feel fear so it seemed like he was coping by becoming like entering that profession. Um, Interesting. And I don't know. In order to wrap up, I think uh, this wasn't really a reputable experiment. I think is what we're trying to get at. Um, yeah. There were many things wrong scientifically. Uh, many things wrong psychologically. Zimbardo was a self insert. Um, also, he coached the experiment to go the way that he wanted it to in some drastic ways like the visiting days and, and although he literally straight up coming up to the guard and saying you are not being aggressive enough yeah and so. although he had good intentions with what he wanted the outcome to be you know the saying stays true the path to hell is paid with good intentions so. yeah it's a uh, yeah any if, if with enough charisma and grift any anybody will follow you into hell um yeah it's like, yeah, like you said, good intentions con- corrupted by a guy who pr- wanted to prove something so much that he like, d- just did it in a really bad way. It kind of let it lead him down a, a weird path. Yeah. Uh, so it's like we agree with his conclusions. We just don't love the experiment or what he's doing with his conclusions, you know? Right. So, and this will, this will bring us to a, another man. Another, uh, another, another n- boy. Not so far away, in the same California and locale. Uh, like we said, there's earlier. something in the goddamn water. <laughs> <laughs> a few years or- earlier, in uh, 1967, 
professor and history teacher at Carberly High School, um, which was like Ron a new, Jones. Yeah, new wave high school, different teaching methods. This guy Ron Jones had a lot of like experiments and I guess he would like to call them S- simulations. Yeah. Right. So um, this school was specifically known for being weird. They were yeah. they allowed their teachers to create their own curriculums and kind of role play experiments. So they would they would let their teachers kind of put their students into situations to teach them about things. Um which is cool. I like that, but it kind of led to some uh something weird. So this guy Ron Jones, um he wasn't he didn't set out with the intention of, you know, proving a psychological theory. He was initially trying to just answer a student's question about, you know, how did kids in Nazi Germany be, get swept up in fascism this. so easily? Yeah. So he was like, okay, and, uh, let's let's try something. Uh, so the next week, the kids come in. He starts uh, being a little different. He's acting a little different. He's not the loosey-goosey kind of guy that they're used to. Right. He's a little strict. Ron Jones was a cool guy. He uh, Rolling up he let them sit wherever they want. Yeah. Students called him Ron, and he chatted with them, and he was always smiling and goofing off, and then they came in one day, and he was sit up very straight. stoic. Not smiling. Strict, yes, yes. He tells the students to sit up straight because it's good for them. It's good for their concentration, helps them breathe better, and gets them all in a line uh, outside the classroom and to- tells them to go inside the classroom and sit at their desks at attention as quickly as possible. And this is just the initial experiment he's trying something out and after he d- he does this with his students a few times he's like all right i think that's pretty fast i think you're good one of the students says i think we can do it faster i think we he can gets go but faster. he get he drills them multiple times aggressively and then gets down to 15 seconds and goes bam you got it and then like yeah so then another student goes hell no we can do this better yeah so they do faster and faster until their class time is up. And after this happened, Ron Jones started to notice that his class would come in every day and sit at attention with their back straight and orderly instead of, you know, the usual loosey-goosey atmosphere he had originally created. So he got this idea. He was like, hmm. He's playing this by ear here. He didn't have a plan. Yeah. Like he did. Okay, did. that's something to keep in mind. He had zero plan. All of this was impromptu like <laughs> he was coming up with it on the fly that is the it best was, and uh, most interesting part of this in my opinion yeah i fucking love that so much <laughs> so uh, a little bit of while passes and uh these kids are sitting in attention so he gets this idea he wants to label this movement he's created this mindset he as wants the to differentiate wave. them from the other people right he's like these kids are good they're, they're better than the rest so he calls them the third wave because he's a surfer, and in surfing lore, the third wave is the strongest. Mm-hmm. So he so tells the them, third wave of America, they're going to be the strongest wave to fix America. They're going to lead the country. They're going to take over the politics. They're going to do everything good and right. And he does. This is what he's telling his students, by the way. This isn't just his. Like he is actively saying, "We are called the third wave because of this." You're going to fix America. And he tells them to salute each other in the halls with a C shape because it looks like a wave. Mm-hmm. But it's very well similar to the Nazi salute. Yeah. They're only supposed to do this to each other. And everyone complied. And he told them if one of the classmates notices someone else not doing this to, you know, tell the teacher. And if they fail to participate in this experiment that he's conducting... They'd be sent to the library and get an F for the class. Right. So uh, one hot. other thing real quick. So what he did was he told the students, if you merely participate, you don't act against this. You just exist in this. You'll get a C. If you actively participate, you'll get an A. And if you go against this, you will be sent to the library for the rest of the semester and get an F for the class. So, yeah, as Nate said, if you caught somebody not following the rules, like saluting each other, you would be sent to the library to get an F. But he also created these little cards where he drew a a wave on it for the members, and specific members got three Xs. 
They were informants. Red X's. They were their jo- red X's. Their job was to go to Jones and snitch on people. But more people. Everyone began snitching. Yeah, more people snitched. So it turned into just a an atmosphere of people snitching on each other, even best friends doing it. Like, um, there's a really good podcast about this that we'll link where they describe how there are these two best friends making a joke about something. I can't remember what it is. It, it was STD. one of the uh, STD, which is uh, what was it? Stay. Uh, what does it stand for? Stronger through discipline. Stronger through discipline. Discipline was the third wave um, slogan. But uh, right. it was also a slogan for a popular detergent at the time. Yeah, it's stronger than dirt. Yeah, stronger than dirt was the. And they made that joke together, and then when they both came into class, uh, Ron Jones the was doing that... his thing where he's listing he's yeah. listing off the people who have like gone against him to be banished to the library, and he lists off one of those two names, and the guy who got listed off just is like what and looks to his friend, and the friend won't look at him, Snitches like he's just like standing bitches. there. Best friends were snitching on each other. All right, so um, as so we continue. The word spreads around campus here, and it starts to attract some attention from other classes and even other schools. Other More schools kids are cutting their class <laughs> to join Ron Jones's third wave, and more people are yep. saluting each other. And eventually, one of the students is like, she starts to question, okay? She's like, what's what's going on here? There's something this is you're not a telling bit us. Toxic. Yeah. yeah. And immediately she gets executed, <laughs> I guess you could say. Executed. In she front gets of everyone. Bonked. Yeah. I think her name was what? Carol? Cheryl. Uh, uh Sherry or Shelly or something. <laughs> yeah, whatever. So she starts a <laughs> counter <Carol>. movement, <laughs> or at least tries to start a counter movement called the Breakers. She's putting up these anti third the wave posters. And they keep getting taken down by the third wave. She does this overnight. She puts them up high, blah, blah, blah. And over time, the third wave amasses 200 participants, not even from... Two fucking hundred. From 30. Started from 30 kids. Yeah. And got to 200. There was a wait line to get into the class. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) There was a literal wait line. And you might be thinking, didn't the principal do anything? Didn't he notice? And, you know... He did, but he didn't give a shit. He was like, all right, whatever. He, he I, didn't give a shit to the point where he did the C salute to Ron Jones. In a faculty <laughs> meeting. In a faculty fucking meeting. Uh, oh, my God. The, as time goes on, Jones decides, he's like, okay, this is getting crazy. Like, he never planned for any of this to happen. He's like a little high on his horse right now, I guess you could say. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he's high Might on power. A drunk with power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Even As, okay. Also, even fist fights were breaking oh, out in the yeah, high school. Oh yeah, at lunch. Yeah, right. Because people were trying to recruit. Like they were doing like recruiting stuff. They had like their tables out with posters. They'd be like, "Hey, do you want to join the third wave?" And the people would be like, "What is it?" And they'd be like, "Because um, what was what was their entire motto? Like it was um, God. Why can't I remember? Strength through um, discipline. Here, wait, let's see. Right, strength through discipline. Strength through unity. Strength through community. Stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. So they would just say strength through unity. And people would go, okay, no, uh, that's very vague, and you're not extra- describing anything. And that would lead to regular fist fights breaking out in the school. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as time goes on, Ron Jones is like, hmm, I can, I can do more. So he sits everyone down. Or actually, it's standing standing room only in his classroom because there's oh, so many Oh, right, he in. turns it, yeah, he turns it into only standing, <laughs> yeah. Standing at attention with their hands behind their back like a fucking soldier. Yeah. He says... That in, in the next day, the third wave would publicly announce its existence to the country as oh, a ro- political party. Not just right. Not just that they would announce this. That this was an this was something happening through thou- a thousand different schools. Teachers were doing this right. with their students to create a youth base for this party that would be announcing itself the next day. And he said that there was a presidential candidate. Um, and by chance, a student had brought in a Time magazine with an ad that said something about the third wave, and he used that as proof. Yeah. So the following it wasn't day, related, but it just was super coincidental. Yeah. Uh, the following day, Ron Jones's bodyguards, um, of whom he actually had, which were just students. <laughs> were, wait, no. Were they students? I thought <laughs> yeah. they were uh, random people. No, they were students. They were, students. They were students? Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, I remember one of them was a student that he specifically said wasn't very intelligent and was an outcast and would eat lunch in his room, so just wanted a purpose and really right. took to being a bodyguard. Yeah. <laughs> he had their bo- had his bodyguards lead all of the students into the gymnasium, and he wheeled in a TV, and he was like, you need to watch because this is going to be the beginning of the third wave. We're going to announce our existence to the country. And these kids all sat down, and they looked at the TV, he turned it on to a blank channel, just snow, and left. Just static. <laughs> yeah. Just, well, yeah, walked out of the room. <laughs> oh, also, there were a bunch of rec- reporters there because this had become a thing, and everybody in the town was like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> right, so a bunch of reporters that. are there. So that kind of legitimized it in the student's mind. And then, yeah, he turns the TV on to snow, walks out. while later, reporters walk out, and then eventually... One of the students snaps, thinking that they're literally going to get gassed, and goes, I'm getting the fuck out of here, and runs away. <laughs> so the doors are locked, uh, and Ron Jones has to come back and calm them all down by, by you know, saying the slogans over and over very quietly until they're all saying it together, and he gets their attention. And he says, what is the poignant line that he says? It's something very Oh, I, yeah, I can't remember the line, but it's like, this is... Uh, you are just as bad as the Nazi youth. Yeah. Something like that. And, like, this is exactly how they did it. And then put on a film about yes. the Nazis radicalizing yes. their base or something like that. Right. And they luckily calmed down and stopped being fucking Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. This has been – this is extremely popular now. It's been adapted into, like, plays, TV series – whatever so there's something there's something that we need to say real quick you might be wondering how quickly this happened yeah how long did this take a semester it took monday to friday (laughs) five (laughs) fucking days for 200 students to think they were part of a revolution this was before internet this was before facebook It took Ron Jones five days to start something like this. Imagine if he actually was a cult leader, a fucking crazy person who wanted to start a revolution. He could have started a militia. Yeah, he didn't get his tenure. uh, Got blamed for. Oh yeah, he lost. Yeah, he lost. Yeah, he was up for tenure and then he lost that. Holy shit! So yeah, I just wanted to talk about that because it happened before the Stanford Prison Experiment, and you know, two guys just drunk with power doing their I, thing so th- real quick before we kind of talk about our just general thoughts on all of this is the wikipedia for the third wave links to some contemporary newspaper clippings of the time and this they're just newspaper they're just like reporters like they're just like newspaper things so i don't know how true these are uh, but they're contemporary, they're pa- Palo Alto newspaper. So there's one of the time that just kind of says, you know, there have been reports of strange happenings in Mr. Jones' contemporary history classes. Something to do with the Gestapo and curved hands. Oh, what? And then there was another one where it said 500 parents during this were going to lead a boycott to get Ron Jones fired because they because of a movement they didn't quite understand. Yeah. Apparently... During this, 500 parents were like, what the fuck is happening? Why are my kids Nazis? <laughs> and also, it says it really quickly and doesn't explain it all. That same report says the students kidnapped Ron Jones at the end of this. Huh? What? Yeah. Like, I don't, again, it doesn't specify anything, and I couldn't find anything else on it. There's just a, a random newspaper article from the Palo Alto newspaper that just, like, yeah, the the students kid at the end. The students kidnapped Ron Jones, Ooh. and he had to calm them down by saying that there would be a rally the next day where they announced their existence to the world. Oh my god! And then he got them to let him go, and then he ended it the next day. That would explain why he ended it. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> and then there's another clipping that talks about how the next year. So this was happening in the 60s so this is happening around the time of the civil rights movement so vietnam black panther the next year after he does this he apparently had a different class somewhere else that he ran another experiment on where he said yeah that dc march that dc march was just the beginning there's gonna be a four million person march on dc (laughs) 
and you're going to be a part of it. And he convinced, because he was in the National Guard, he convinced his students that the group he was in had infiltrated the National Guard with 12,500 men and that that would be the basis for protecting the march on D.C. and for the revolution. And he convinced his students again that there would be a revolution happening. And then the next day he was like, nah, I'm just fucking with you. That was an experiment. (laughs) All right. I didn't know that. Um, but I, I still have a positive opinion of Ron Jones. Uh, like he's, I no, I kind I kind of fucking love this. It's weird and it was dangerous, but like he did it to show like, hey, anybody can become fascist. Yeah, anybody. You are fully equipped to deal with fascism once you go through that. But he was a uh, anti-fascist. He was a supporter of the Black Panthers. You might say he was um, Antifa. <laughs> uh, original Antifa. Oh man. Doing the Lord's work. Yeah. Whatever Lord that may be. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to talk about the third wave, and we both wanted to talk about the Stanford Prison Experiment. I, yeah, it started just talking about the Stanford Prison Experiment, and then I was like, this is kind of – I don't know how we're going to make this funny because we do kind of – we do want to joke around. We do want this to be fun. And I was like, I don't know how I'm going to make this funny. And then – we started talking about the third wave and I was just like, man, we're just going to be talking about like systemic issues and like <laughs> how easy it is. Yeah. Cause like when you, when you listen to these, when you hear these things, you're just like, wow. It's like, yeah. Okay. Zimbardo was fucky and he coached people into it. But really what that did was the out, the, the consequences of Zimbardo's experiment was not that people naturally turned to evil. What it did was show that with the right authority figure under the right conditions, people will do pretty much anything yeah they'll be subjects of and, indoctrination and gladly so just like with the ron jones things and that that is even more terrifying than zimbardo's experiment it's because it's like because he didn't have a plan he was just he didn't have a plan it was in five days and he started it out he told his students that it was going to be one of his experiments yeah but they just went along with it anyway and then he legitimized it in their heads and made them start snitching on each other. Cre- they created a fucking secret police, and they were like, it was ho- ooh, horrible. <laughs> and this is just so possible, and it really, with everything going on right now, it's kind of terrifying. It really makes you think. Makes you go... Really hmm. makes you think. Basically, kill your heroes is what we're trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> yes, murder them in your minds. <laughs> don't, don't follow people have your own ideas fight for what you believe in don't follow good ideas not charisma unless it's us don't kill us if we're your heroes please (laughs) i want to live god i hope we're not your heroes (laughs) yeah we're just two idiots Um, we're just two fucking idiots and with that we're gonna start ending this thank you for watching (laughs) bye-bye you know bye-bye